uh, heartache, and uh, she had uh, either divorced or they had died, uh, whichever had happened to some or both, I assume, from what we're seeing here, had happened in that particular circumstance. And now she had pretty much given up on the covenant relationship of marriage. Again, if I had a few hours to preach to you, I'd love to preach about the covenant relationship of marriage that is entered in today. Marriage is just not sex. Marriage is just not living together. Together, Marriage is a unique relationship that God uh, did, uh, made uh, back in the Garden of Eden when he united uh, Adam and Eve together. He designed it for a specific reason and relationship. And here this lady had, had lost trust in the, uh, in the false god and lost trust in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, practice of marriage and lost trust in the covenant of God. And so uh, uh, here uh, she came out to draw water in the middle of the day. Uh, first of all, let's look at the heart of Jesus in that. Uh, Jesus was tired and he was weary. And uh, he, he, he knew what was coming and he could have easily said, uh, you know, what's it worth for one poor haggardly woman that has wasted her life and thrown her life away and cares nothing about the things of God, why in this world should I uh, even concern myself and be weird? I can go somewhere else and I can have a quiet time of repose and rest and I won't have to be worried with the problems of the day. It's the pressure of ministry that's got me to the place that I'm at today and I'd be better off to rest and be ready uh, to do my work tomorrow. But that's not the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus was that there was a poor, struggling sinner that needed to know Jesus. This lady... Uh, that came to the well today with all the sins that burdened her down, if she didn't come to a real visible knowledge of who the Lord Jesus Christ was, she was going to have more problems than being married five times. She was going to be having more problems than living with somebody. She was going to be more having more problems than being shunned and shamed by the people of that uh, city in which she lived in. She was going to have the problem one day. She was going to have to stand and give an answer to her God in, her, uh, in heaven that was going to be her judge and answer why she lived that way. And Jesus knew that one day she'd have to stand before him in judgment and he had mercy on her. And so Jesus sat there by the well. Isn't it amazing that the heart of Jesus was there? Remember, Jesus had not long ago left his throne in heaven there where the angels ministered to him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, in this place the Bible says that, that an angel came and ministered to Jesus. And, uh, and so he, he left the throne of glory sitting there in the majesty of heaven in his eternal presence and he donned the robe of flesh, became weary and we find him not sitting enthroned in the heaven but because he loved me and you, he's sitting on the side of an old broken down well. What a heart. What, what, what we see in the love of the Master. See, we just read back over when Jesus had talked to Nicodemus, uh, uh, John 3.16, which we quote so easily and so uh, flippantly sometimes and so uh, heretically sometimes because we quote it as if it's something that we're familiar with. And I want to tell you, John 3.16 is not something you're familiar with. John 3.16 is something that you bow the knee to. John 3.16, it shows the love of Jesus' heart. John 3.16 calls the God of heaven his only dearly beloved Son. John 3.16 says, For God so loved loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16 said Jesus would sit by the well and wait for a woman that the world said does not deserve to even have a part of us. And there she was walking not to the well where everybody else would walk. No, because everybody else looked at her and they did what the world did. You know what they did? The women gathered together and you know what they did? They curled their lip and they said she's one of them. She can't keep a husk. And so now, rather than go through marriage, she just shacked up with somebody. You know what she does for a living? She's a prostitute, except they wouldn't have used quite that nice a word. And the men would walk by. They'd look at her. Say, oh, she's a loose woman. She, she, uh, she, she's easy to get. They looked at her with contempt, but just like the woman that Jesus would find in adultery and stoop down and right on the ground, all those pious folks would, 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 would be around her and wanting to throw the stones at her and kill her, and Jesus would right on the ground, and he'd look up and they'd start easing off one by one. You know why? Because in their heart they was just like her. They wanted the same thing that she wanted. See, Jesus knows the heart. He knows your heart this morning. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what your desires are. Well, we cloak them pretty good. It's easy to talk about somebody else. It's easy. To, but see, the God of heaven loved this woman just like he loves you in your sin. 
See, one day you were just like either Nicodemus or the woman at the well. One day you were either a religious person and you came up with your religiosity to Jesus and you came before him and said, when are you going to start the kingdom? Us, we say, hey, I'm ready for you, man. I've cleaned up. I've got good. I go to church. Let's get this thing on. Come to without religion. And God says, don't want your dirty religion. Have no need of it. I'm talking about truth. Or you came like this woman. You came full of sin, laden down with a burden of sin, laden down with a guilt of sin. And in your mind, you thought, there's no way I'm worthy. See, there's two extremes, are there? And one that thinks he's worthy and then one that thinks they're not worthy, and they're both wrong. God speaks to both of them. He says, I care both of you equally. I came to seek and to save those that were lost. You need to see the heart of God. This morning, I want to tell you, you will not live for God, nor can you come to God without knowing the heart of God. It's a sick, a, a, a sick weekly religion that makes folks very uncomfortable that comes to a religion to satisfy only man's conscience. To absolve him of his guilt. I want to tell you, folks, you need more of being absolved of your guilt. You need a Savior. You need someone that's going to put a brand new person inside of you, not change that ugly one that's in there. So we see, first of all, the heart of Jesus. Now uh, we see the heart of this woman. Uh, she comes to Jesus. He's sitting there on the well waiting for her. He, he's, he's taking that trip. He knows what others are going to say about him, matter of fact. He knows what those religious Pharisees are going to say. He knows uh, what uh, the scribes are going to say. He knows uh, what the Sadducees are going to say. He knows, knows what those uh, up the up folks are going to say. He's going through Samaria. What kind of rabbi would ever put his foot on that dirt? I want to tell you, it's one that loved somebody. And so she came, and uh, he came, and he, he's uh, sitting there, and, and she's taken aback. Uh, her, her, her eyes are downcast. She's weary. She's tired. She's carried a big old water pot uh, out to this place to get enough water to last her and the husband, and, uh, that, not husband the man that she's living with. And um, it, it's hot, tiresome work. And she comes out there. And here she sees, notice what she says. She curls her lip. She says, he's a Jew. She had as much animosity towards him as possible. She didn't see him as a savior. She saw him as an enemy. She, she saw him as one that ridiculed and laughed at them, called them half-breeds. She, she, she saw that. And so he said to her, it startled her beyond imagination, would you give me a drink of water? And uh, she looked at him and said, you're a Jew. You asked me to give you a drink? You don't, you know, well, why are you even speaking to me? Haven't had time to cover it. We're going to look at this one, but just real briefly now. Here she was, a Samaritan. That made her bad enough. Worse than that, she was a woman. In that culture, a woman was only the property of a man. When you married someone, she became your property. And uh, she had certain obligations out of that relationship as your property. And uh, she was not considered on the same level as a man. She had a, a less, less value in society. You're talking about a woman's movement that had been in trouble. That day, a woman's movement would have been in deep trouble because men ruled. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just telling you how it was. And, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we see that the, uh, the, the, the circumstance was terrible. So she was a Samaritan and she was a woman. A Jew, a rabbi, would not speak to a Samaritan, nor would he speak to a woman. He would barely speak to a devout Jewish woman. Seldom in public. I mean, this is a society like you, you cannot imagine. If you think today that, that we live in a society uh, where, where men uh, uh, do not always act as they should, you ought to have lived in that society. It was abusive. It was atrocious. And so here she saw, and, and so uh, she also, uh, not only that, she was a prostitute. I mean, she was as low as it could get. And she knew it. 
She knew what happened. She, 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 she took the, the effort to walk out this, uh, air, this, this uh, a little over a half a mile out of the city of Sychar uh, to Jacob's well. She took the effort to go there in the heat of the day when nobody else would see her. I mean, she, she, she in her heart, she didn't believe she hardly deserved to be a human being to be on planet Earth. And when this Jew speaks to her, she looks at him in utter contempt, saying, what are you doing? You're giving an order to me? I'm nothing, and you, you know I'm nothing, and you all Jews treat me like I'm nothing. And uh, so Jesus deals with her different than he deals with Nicodemus. He looks at her, at her, having a heart of love to her, and he begins to prod her being and draw her to the Lord, to bring her to himself, to become her Savior. And, and it's interesting, I'm going to look, our time's almost up, I'm going to look at it very quickly because i got to see the results and, and, and everything. So, uh, so he, he says to her, in verse 9, I'm going to do real fast now, he said, how did you be after the drink? For you drew, Jews have no drink. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift uh, that I'm doing for you, give, give me your drink, you would have asked. And she says, sir, you don't have anything to draw from. What are you talking about? You're talking about living water? You don't even have a cup to draw from. By the way, they wouldn't have took a cup here. This was a deep well, and you'd have to drop a bucket down there, and you'd have to pull water up. It wasn't an easy, pleasant task to get water out of this well. And he, she's saying, you don't have ability. You don't have a way to get anything out of this well. See, Jesus is bringing her to the place. Oh, I hate having my finger in the diet. Um, a good study for you Bible students. The Bible, if you'll go back and start at Jacob's well and start studying the wells, of the Bible, and, and see uh, of, of the representation of the well. The wells are a picture of Jesus and a picture of salvation. Wells mean more than Bible than just places that draw water. And this living water is salvation that's being talked about. And he's drawing her to that. And uh, so uh, he, he begins to talk with her and says, uh, who, uh, you, you need water, but you need a different kind of water. Uh, she had a desire in her heart that was much different. It wasn't that she was thirsty. It was she was thirsty. She needed Jesus. She needed something that would last. She tried man after man after man. She tried self-religion. She tried all these things, and she found herself abused and empty. And Jesus knew that, and Jesus said, I hear your heart. I know you are. You need living water. So um, he tells her that he will give her water. She won't have to walk out to that well and draw every day. She won't have to put that in up. And so he says, uh, she says to him, the woman said to him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst and never come here again. Now, most salvation messages and most evangelization stops right there. Here we've got a woman that we've come before, Jesus has talked to. She's acknowledged she wants to live in water, and she's asked for it. And we say, come on, you're ready. Let's be saved. But that's not true. If you stop there, you have not got a saved person. You've got a person that has been enlightened, but you don't have a person that's been saved. You've got a person that has seen what's necessary, but you hadn't seen a person that's entered into what's necessary. Jesus knew that. Jesus didn't stop just there. See, what it takes to be saved is first the knowledge. It takes knowledge, but the Bible says then you must repent. And to repent, you have to know who you are. You are a sinner, and you need to repent of your sins. And till you allow Jesus to put his finger on your sin, and you recognize that's your sin, and that that's the reason that you are being judged, and that's the reason you're going to spend eternity in hell, is because you're a sinner, you cannot be saved. A person cannot go to heaven without first repenting of their sins. See, we, we have a bloodless uh, salvation being preached from many fundamental pulpits anymore. All we tell folks that they have to do is to believe and be baptized. My Bible says you have to believe and repent to be saved. You have to come to a knowledge of who you are. You will never come to that knowledge without, first of all, seeing the heart of God. You will never come to that knowledge without, second of all, seeing your own heart and sinfulness. And you will never come to that knowledge until you admit you're a sinner. And I want to tell you, Jesus is in the business of pointing out sin. We've got today a church that wants to be pleasant to folks. We've got a church today that wants to make folks feel comfortable. We've got a church today that doesn't want to point out the obvious. We today need a church that says God is calling sinners to repentance. That's what's wrong with the church today. We've got folks on our church rolls that are not part of the kingdom of heaven. I'll show you that briefly in a minute. Y'all don't give up on me. I'm trying. I'm hurrying. 
So uh, he tells her that, uh, then he says, okay, this is what you need to do. He says, go and call your husband. What was he doing? He was taking that wound and he was pressing his finger in it. It caused pain. I want to tell you, coming to Jesus can cause some pain. If we want to get over that, we, we want to pass. It's much easier. Oh, y'all just come and join the church and do the best you can. Believe that Jesus died for you and you're going to go to heaven. And you leave folks empty. And we wonder why folks go from church to church to church trying to find some, some uh, solace for their soul. Or they come in and out of church. Uh, they, they come to church long enough to get their conscience satisfied and then they're gone again. And then when their conscience bears them witness, uh, they're back again and they're gone again and they're back again and gone again. We've done a disservice because we haven't probed the wound. We haven't allowed them to see that God knows their sin and God will deal with their sin, but they've got to deal with their sin with God. They've got to allow God to do so. And so he began to probe her and he said to her, all right, I see what, what's going on here. And so she tries to avoid the issue. She said, ouch! Okay, I hear you. Yeah, she says, yeah, you're right. Ooh, and Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You said, well, you don't have a husband. You've had five and you're living with somebody now. That was the omniscience of God. As a matter of fact, I don't have time again this morning to discuss it, but that's a picture of the, of the judgment of God on judgment day. That's what's going to be happening. There's going to be sinners that did not bow the knee today and they're going to go before God on judgment day and they're going to say, God, why well, I'm not in heaven. And then God's going to tell them, but it's going to be too late. Way, way, way too late. They'll be at the judgment of God. It's appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. It's coming. And here Jesus shows that. And so he tells her that. He says, she says, okay, let me, let me help myself here. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You're going to butter him up some. That's what folks do to Jesus, don't they? Oh, I see you're good, God. I see, I see how, how great you are. I, yeah, that, that's good. I, I like a prophet. But Jesus is more than a prophet. Oh, he is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Uh, and so he says, and she says, oh, I love it. He, she says, well, yeah, but we worship you at Mount Gerizim. And uh, Jesus said, yeah, I hear about your worship. She, she tried to cover up the pain with religion. So I've got religion, and Jesus exposes that bear. He says, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I want to tell you something. That worship you have up at Gerizim, it's not real. And that, that the Jews do rightfully down in Jerusalem, it's passing away. It's going to be done away with. I want to tell you, if you're going to know God, you have to know Him in spirit and truth. You've got to become a worshiper. Listen, true believers, that their sins are brought before them and they repent of them, their sins, those folks become worshipers. Those are the folks that you don't have to gin up worship for. I'm going to cover a very deep subject now in about two minutes and give you two points and be gone, okay? The problem today is folks do not know how to worship God. We have a church that is ginning up worship. We believe worship is external. I know folks today that can't come to church and feel they've, they've been to church unless they've had a certain style of music and a certain style of preaching. They are soulish. They are governed by their soul, their flesh. They, they are energized by the flesh. They are worshiping externally, just like these folks here at Gerizim in Jerusalem. They were externally worshiping God. True worship must come from the inside. See, God is a spirit, and He is not impressed with our soulish worship. God is not impressed with our songs. God is not impressed uh, with, with our methods. God is not impressed with our buildings. God is not impressed uh, with all the things we go through. God is not impressed with preaching. God is impressed with folks that have joined their spirit to his spirit. God is a spirit. That's what he says here. That is where real, wor real worship must come from a person that has joined their heart to the heart of God. When that happens, wherever God is, they can worship. John was on the Isle of Patmos. He had been exiled there. And you know what the Bible says? He was in the flesh on the Lord's day. And he worshiped God. Is that what they said? Not if you're a Bible student, that's not what he said. He was in the what? Spirit. He didn't need a church. He didn't need a choir. He didn't need pews. He didn't need air conditioning. You know what he needed? 
His spirit to be joined to the spirit of the eternal God. And I want to tell you, he had to throw down worship. More that's going to happen in the most churches across this world today. Because folk come to church to see what they can get out of God. You know how I know that? Because they don't serve God. Worship leads to service. So what did she need to do? She had to call out to Jesus. This is the third point of the four. And so Jesus says to her, the woman says, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said, here it is. You got him. I am him. I'm, I am is literally what he said. He said, I'm the answer to your problems. If you will in spirit enter into this relationship with me, that's the reason the Holy Spirit comes into the life. That's the reason no man can come to the Father unless the Spirit draw him. That's the reason the earnest of down payment of the Spirit is given in our lives. That is how we're connected in hell to God. It's a spiritual, mystical union between us and God, uh, through God, uh, that we have this relationship with him. That's the reason only true worship comes when we, in the power and energy of the Holy Spirit, link our hearts, our beings up with God, and we follow him. Him, and we say, you indeed are the one. The only one. But that's the reason any religion does not place Jesus as God as a false religion. He is the only answer. There's not another answer. You must be spiritually connected to God. And the only way for that to happen is to, uh, to repent of your sins, by faith believe on the Lord Jesus, and receive the promise of the Spirit of God that you might spiritually worship Him. need some time on that. So what's the result? What is the result then for? This is the last one, you that are counting. What is the result of that? The lady went back home, reformed her ways, started reading her Bible, and we never heard from her again. Once again, Bible students, is that a correct rendering of Scripture? No. You know what she did? Having worshipped God, that's what, that's what happened. When she, when she conceded and admitted and repented and, said, and agreed with Jesus that he is the Messiah, the Spirit of God entered her, and she went immediately back to the place that hated her, back to the place that despised her, or back to the household that cared nothing about her. And you know what? Her testimony was so vibrant. Her life so alive, her life so changed, so different, walking in the power of the Spirit of God, she evangelized Sychar. That's what happens with folks that enter into worship. They don't sing all together. They don't preach all together. They don't have Sunday school class all together. That's part of, of, of the ritual of church. But I'm going to tell you, that's all you've got. You've got emptiness. Folks that are worshiping God have a vibrant spirit of the living God that spreads abroad to other folks, wicked folks, evil folks, sinful folks, and those folks see a difference in our lives and we then are able to evangelize them as they see the difference that God has made in our lives. They saw something different in this woman. You know what the problem is? Most of us think we just had a little sin and we just need a little cleaning. The truth of the matter is, Every person that's ever come to Jesus had just as much sin as this woman did. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We have all together gone out of the way. We're every one of us hopeless until we cry out to him. Jesus would say something else. He gave a parable. He said he was in the Simon's house. And Simon said, why are you letting this lady wash your feet? And Jesus looked at him and said, Simon, I came into your house and you didn't offer a basin to wash my feet. But this woman hasn't ceased washing my feet with her tears since I entered it. He said, Simon, to whom little is forgiven or to whom much is forgiven, which one loves me the most? And the answer to that question is the one that Jesus forgives a lot. No amount of preaching, no amount of cajoling, no amount of emotional soulish stirrup can do what the Spirit of God can do. Nothing but the Spirit of God can convict you and me of our sins. No amount of working it up, no amount of all this uh, 
flip-flop, razzle-dazzle, frazzle going on in the church today, and the name of religion will change a man's heart, a lady's heart, a girl's heart, a woman's heart. Only one thing will do it. That when you see that Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. That's not talking about babies, friends. That's talking about us. Have you come to Jesus? Have you had an experience that when you got back around folks, they looked at you and said, whoo, something's changed. There's something different about this person. And I can put my finger on it. You know, there's some folks that say, hmm, there's something different about it. Did you change your cologne? You wearing a different perfume? You change your outfit. There's something different about you. I can't put my finger on it. I want to tell you, if you get a good dose of Jesus, they'll be able to put their finger on it. Yes, they will. And listen, you need not be afraid. Say, well, they'll run from me. Not if you've got Jesus. Not if you've got the Holy I mean, if you've got religion, you're out there just trying to convert somebody so you can come to church and say, oh, I did something. But no, if you've got Jesus in your heart, I want to tell you, you've got a power beyond anything this world has ever seen. The love, the love of Jesus will reach out to poor, brokenhearted, lost folks. They need you. They're desperately crying, would someone give me an answer? They're trying every weird and wild thing out there you can imagine. They need hope. They need the truth. They need us, church. But they need to change us. They need a different us than they've seen before. They need folks that are led by the Spirit. Are you a spiritual person? Is God ebbing and flowing out of your life? and touching others. If not, there's something wrong. And listen this morning. If what I'm talking to this morning is weird to you, and you have no idea, one of two things are wrong. Number one, I haven't done a good job of expressing it. That I do. I understand. I repent. And, 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 or you are living in darkness, and you need to come to light. You are lost, and you need to be found. You are a sinner and you need to be saved. I don't know how many different ways I can say it, but you don't have Jesus, and you need him, and I'm here to beg you and tell you he's worth it, and he'll change. No matter what, no matter what, no matter what, no matter where, how, how good we got some folks that think they're good, and we've got some folks that think they're bad. Either case, God loves you, and he's waiting on you, and he'll change you, make a difference in your life. Father, speak to our hearts. Do what this preacher cannot do. Speak to the hearts and the souls of these men and women, boys and girls. Challenge our very hearts. Are we true worshipers? Are we worship in spirit and in truth? Are we worshiping through our soul, through our flesh? What accommodates us? What feels good? How, how, how much is going on around about us? How good it is? All these things, Father, that affect the flesh. Are we looking and saying, Lord, I want to hear from heaven. I, I, I want to know what you want. I want, to, I want to feel like you feel. I want to see your heart. I want to obey your will. I want to worship you, not like the world worships you, Father. I want to worship you as a spirit. I want to know you. I want to love you. I want to serve you. I want to be different. Father, speak as only you can to this congregation today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand and sing. I know the hour's late, but I want to tell you, eternity's a long time. And to miss eternity is to miss everything.